I have my own definition of leadership that I've kind of conjured up over the years. Uh, it's uh, creating an environment, which is the operating words, uh, in which you attract the best and the brightest people. Uh, those people can then use their uh, judgment autonomously to make decisions. Uh, those decisions are consistent with the mission and vision of the company and with whom you share not just the financial but also, and importantly, the psychic rewards of success. I think the um, first principle for me of leadership is the idea of stewardship, uh, and uh, as in contrast to proprietorship. Stewardship is about um, what we can do together to build something great that we can then be proud of, and proprietorship is um, what can you do today to make me more rich and famous and successful? Um, and you can walk into an organization and listen to the leadership talk about the company, and in the first 10 seconds, 20 seconds, you can understand whether it's a stewardship or proprietorship by the vocabulary. Uh, in proprietorship, the vocabulary is I, me, mine, and, 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 and me. And in stewardship, it's uh, we, us, and ours. And as soon as you hear those words, you know exactly what's going on. I'm a believer in that, in that concept of stewardship. And then I think the job of leadership is to um, build trust. Um, and building trust, in my personal opinion, uh, means that you have to trust first. And that's something that many people are very reluctant to do. Not just in business, but in their personal relationships as well. I think the way you build trust is by going first. And uh, in a company, that means uh, sharing information and decision making with people beyond what is normally expected. Uh, can that trust be betrayed? It can be. Uh, but the cost of the occasional betrayal uh, is far lower than the benefit of building trust with the rest of the people. As an example of building trust, I recall when we were a small company of, oh, I mean, 35 people or so, and <clears throat> the executive committee was sitting in a room saying, you know, we really have a lot of shares outstanding. We're hiring these people. They think they're getting more than they're actually getting because they don't do the math. We all do percentages, you know, and it just doesn't feel good. So we probably ought to do a reverse split of the stock. And... Um, so then we had this lengthy discussion, and of course, you know, it was like, oh, well, you know, all the engineers are going to get mad at us because they feel like something was taken away from them. So I said, well, why don't we let them make the decision? So I went into the company meeting that we used to hold once a week because we were that kind of company. Uh, and I said, um, I walked in holding a $10 bill, and I said, anybody have two fives for 10? And we changed money. And I said, so you're, you're indifferent whether you have a ten or two fives, which means we're here to talk about a reverse split. And then I said, you know, we're going to tell you everything we know and tell you the reasons why we're talking about it. And it's your decision. Whatever you want to do, we'll, we'll, we'll abide by that. Uh, so we had this lengthy discussion. I learned that day that the only thing engineers like better than engineering is financial engineering. We decided that we would go ahead and, and reverse split the stock. Uh, the only objection they had had was, well, when we hire people, we might not be as competitive. And I said, if you tell them what you now know, you will have won the war of integrity and, and forthrightness. And they thought about that and said, that's a good thing. So two things came out of that uh, session that I thought was very interesting. Uh, the first, uh, I sat down with my executive team, who was a little reluctant on this. And I said, I think it's worth noting that when we educated them with all these things, that they made exactly the right decision, more importantly, for exactly the same reasons that we would have. So therefore, we can trust them to do the right thing if we give them the information. And I think that was you know, uh, uh, illustrative. And then the second part of the, of, the, of the anecdote is that, in my mind, there's no doubt that had we said we're reverse putting the stock and then given them exactly the same information, that some of those people would have walked away feeling like somebody picked their pocket. Somehow or another, I got, I got screwed in this deal. So that was an exercise that, you know, how many companies give the decision of capital structure to the engineering base, the, you know, 35 engineers? 
Nobody. Trust is, um, it's, like a, it's like a bank account. It's like a savings account. Someday you're going to have hard times and you're going to want people to stand by you and do the right thing. And if you haven't made any deposits in the trust bank, then there's nothing to take out. I give advice to my students about board management. Uh, and it's a little, you know, a little different. So the advice is that if you don't listen to your board, you may or may not get fired. But if you listen to your board, you'll definitely get fired. And what does that mean? Uh, that means that a board of directors, and I serve on many boards, a board of directors actually wants the CEO to run the company. Uh, and when they start telling the CEO what to do and the CEO starts doing that, then in fact they're running the company and boards of directors, you know, they fly in at 30,000 feet once a month, they do a you know, pulse check and then they get on their airplane and they fly out. So they don't really know what's going on in the company. And the CEO has to actually take responsibility for what's going on. Now, that being said, you can't be, you know, rude, you can't be, you know, you can't be abrasive, you can't be confrontational, but you have to take responsibility. So if you want to do something, you know, you go socialize in advance, you work with people, you sell them, and it's your job to do that. It's your job to sell your ideas. In 1994, we set in place a five-year strategy for the company, uh, and it called for, in a way, transforming the company in a way that we couldn't afford to do organically because we were very small. And so we decided we would have to do this through acquisition. Um, unlike many acquisitions, which are, you know, you wake up the next morning and say, what's your name again? <laughs> a lot of acquisitions are like that. Um, but this is one that we had thought about for a long time. We probably looked at 20 companies, you know, over the over the years. And in 1997, three years later, we finally uh, found the right partner, and we were both public companies at the time. And we announced that we're going to do this merger. And um, Wall Street got mad at me. Our stock went down by two thirds. Our investors called my board of directors to tell them to fire that moron that's running the company, ruining a great thing. Um, of course, we had been working with the board for years on this idea, so they, they stood by us. Um, we, we were $36 million the prior year. They were $36 million the prior year. We closed the deal. We shed $15 million of their business. Uh, our stock was in the toilet. Uh, but we finished the year at $120 million, and we became a hero. Uh, now, two years later, uh, we did the second act of the same strategy, which involved another big, gigantic merger. Uh, I went to Wall Street and I said, remember me, you know, the last time, if you stuck with me, you got like, you made a lot of money. Um, they didn't listen, they just hit the sell button and moved on and you got mad at me and they called up my board of directors and told them to fire me again. Uh, we merged a $200 million company with a $200 million company and we did $700 million. So we did the right thing for the company. No question we did the right thing for the company. Mm -hmm.